short order. Paul, thank you uh, for coming today. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. It's really nice to see you. It's, uh, it's just a, it's a pleasure to be here today for, uh, for, for Dan. I hope uh, all of you that have, are just meeting Dan for the first time get a chance to talk to him for a little bit. And I think you'll uh, find a little story is uh, Dan actually found out I was not running before my parents did. <laughs> True story. When I, when I made the decision, which has been so difficult, it was a difficult decision to make. Uh, I just uh, love representing uh, all of you, and it's been just a wonderful eight years. But when I made the decision that I wasn't going to be able to run, uh, Dan was the person I thought of. And I reached out to him, and I called him, and I said, you got to run. <laughs> and uh, and uh, he thought about it and thought about it. And I said, but then I, the second thing I said is, you can't run unless your wife is 100% behind you. And I said, make sure. So I kind of gave him the good and the bad. I was hoping not to scare him <laughs> off. And, uh, but it's a really, it's, a, it's just a wonderful uh, thing. I, and I, I don't think that, uh, that I could recommend it highly enough. And I was extremely delighted that Melissa said yes. <laughs> and that Dan was able to run. He's just a, a great guy who I've known for a long time. Then I found out he actually married a Democrat, and so I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a good sign. I, I didn't even do that. My wife's a Republican, so. <laughs> so but uh, seriously, I, it is just a, an immense uh, honor to be able to be supporting Dan, to be able to endorse him formally. He's just somebody who is really bright. A little quiet sometimes, but beneath that quiet uh, exterior is somebody that's a really brilliant guy, uh, very, very uh, smart, very thoughtful, very nice, very caring, and just a person of real integrity. And uh, I think he's somebody that I will be proud to vote for and see as my state representative next time around. And with that, I just wanted to introduce you, Dan. Thank, Thank you, Paul. Thank you so much uh, for coming today. This is fantastic. I, uh, I, I was a little bit worried when I looked at the forecast this morning, and I know that everyone has a lot of demands on their time during the summer, um, so it was really good of all of you to come out. This is fantastic. And Paul, thank you. Uh, I, I've uh, got big shoes I'm trying to fill. Um, you know, Paul, Paul has done an excellent job for the district, and, and not, um, not to echo too much of what he said, but uh, he's, he's done an excellent job for the district as a Republican in a state that obviously is, um, the, the, the degree of imbalance almost deprives the word imbalance of all meaning. There, there's, there's such a small minority, but Paul has been, as he said, an independent voice for this district. And, and that doesn't necessarily mean uh, independent, uh, as Ross Perot was an independent, but independent of the machine that drives Beacon Hill right now and that, uh, to my mind, has driven us into the hole that we're in right now. Uh, before I get too far uh, into, you know, before my log gets rolling too far downhill, I want to uh, pause and thank Brendan and Tristan O'Leary for hosting us here today in their beautiful home. Uh, Brendan and Tristan are two of my dearest friends in the world. Uh, they married each other, which was convenient for me. <laughs> <laughs> I met them in, in college, and, and even more convenient for me, a year ago they moved to Holliston, which was a tremendous treat. Um, and so they're great friends, and, and, and uh, this is awfully nice of them to do. We need to build a contrary voice in the state house, whether that be Republicans, whether that be genuine independents. I don't know that it matters so much. What I do know is what is happening in the state house week after week is, not to get melodramatic about it, but it's undemocratic. And the best example, and the one that I give all the time, and the one that not too many people recognize happens. This year, when uh, the budget debate began in the House, they passed a rule uh, to govern the terms of debate in which it said literally, debate, debate will take place in caucus chambers, so very literally behind closed doors. And they went behind closed doors for hours and hours and hours on end, came out and voted. Went back behind closed doors for hours and hours and hours on end, came out and voted. And independent voices like Paul stood up and said this was wrong, but it's, it, there's, there's such an overwhelming majority that they can literally do almost anything they want to do. So it's all out of the public eye, and behind closed doors, what happens? Well, this year, as the budget process started, it was estimated that the state was $1.3 billion in deficit going into the budget process. So you would think 
responsible legislators would go behind closed doors if that's where they're going to do things and figure out how to get us out of that $1.3 billion deficit. But that's not what they did. Instead, they added $220 million in, in, in additional spending on top of that. And there's a reason for that. That's so that in the election year, um, legislators can go back to their districts and say, look what I got on the budget. Didn't I do a great job? Now, that's appalling enough. But we just found out last week, as the budget process drew to an end and, and the governor uh, let loose his token vetoes, which most of them will get overridden. On background, some members of the Senate have discussed with the State House News their, uh, their um, prediction that they will come back in November for a special session to deal with spending cuts. Now, why or why would they come back in November to deal with spending cuts? You can bet it'll be after the first Tuesday in November, but that's a cynical way to govern. It's cynical and it's arrogant, and it presumes that you're not paying attention or that you don't care. And I, having been there, having worked in that, in that environment, and understanding how to push back against that while being respectful and while not, while not being um, someone who's all about burning the house down, that's not me. You can change that dynamic simply by being willing to stand up and point to it and draw attention to it. Um, my best example of that, and it's a very, very tangible example, and quite frankly, it's an experience that had I not gone through it, I wouldn't be doing this, was uh, some of you may remember in 2005, there was an enormous legislative fight over a piece of legislation uh, that came to be known as Melanie's Law. It was drunk driving legislation. We had some of the most lax drunk driving laws in, this, in the country, in this state. And I had some experience prosecuting drunk driving cases before I came to the state house. And I had the great privilege of working with the team that wrote uh, Melanie's Law. I, I, I was a primary author of Mel Melanie's Law. And um, that piece of legislation was stonewalled when we first introduced it in the House. Uh, it, we were told there was no way it was going to pass. We were told every year the governor puts forth drunk driving legislation. Every year it doesn't get out of the Judiciary Committee. We had the great fortune to have a man named Ron Bersani, who, uh, whose uh, granddaughter had been killed by a drunk driver who was willing to give up his time and come to the State House and walk around with myself and a couple other staffers to individual legislators' offices and say, here's what we're doing, here's why, and say to them very respectfully, but very directly, when we leave here, we're going to talk to Fox News, or we're going to talk to the Boston Globe, or we're going to talk to the Herald, and we're just going to let them know where you are on this. So what can we tell them? Uh, people respect that, and I think Paul, Paul would agree. It's a place where, you know, politics is a rough and tumble business, but people respect being told what you're going to do and why you're going to do it, even if they don't agree with it. And my feeling is you can get a lot done by pushing hard and never stabbing people in the back. And that, that's, that's my approach. Ultimately, we had an enormous legislative fight over Melanie's Law. It was on the front page of the Globe and the Herald for a week running, both papers. And in the end, we passed that bill. And a year later, there was a big Globe headline about how uh, drunk driving deaths on the Commonwealth's roads had plummeted in that year. And that was a tremendously gratifying feeling to think, through some effort uh, that I was privileged to be a part of, there are people walking around now who otherwise would not be walking around. You never know who they are or who they might not be, but that's just statistically, that, that's the case. And that's a tremendous feeling. And that taught me that even in this place where there is tremendous imbalance, and even in this place where Quite often, the independent voice is steamrolled. You can get things done if you're willing to just buckle down, work hard, not worry about rocking the boat. Uh, another, Sylvie likes to rock the boat. Too. Uh, another, um, another thing that I believe very strongly is that in this state, one of the big problems, other than the enormous imbalance, is there are too many legislators who get elected and then their entire uh, purpose in going to work every day is to hold on to that seat. It's all about the next cycle. It's all about not rocking the boat. It's all about pleasing leadership so that they can climb the ladder, so they can get a better committee assignment or, frankly, a better office. And they cling to that seat for dear life. That's not me. That wasn't Paul. Paul's been there for eight years, and eight years is enough. 